anyway, it's great to see so many people here so late. I know that Beverly said she wanted to get away absolutely on time, and I'm sure that you do too, so I'm going to go through this really fast. I am no longer a civil servant, which means that I have to do the research for this myself, and it was very interesting about one of the things that I'm finding about the changing government, or maybe it's because I'm not a civil servant anymore, is that data is opaque. And I was trying to find out the qualification levels in different areas of the children's workforce. I was trying to find out how much money is spent on training and development now compared to how much we spent in 2010 on, job, on training and development. And the truth is I couldn't find the map, and I'm pretty good at surfing the net. So that in itself is a very serious concern. And one that I think we need to be talking to your local authorities and the central government about is how do we know what's happening? How do we know where the money is going? Um, I think there's a funny notion about the children's workforce because, well, what is it? It's in all three sectors, obviously, the public sector, the public sector, the private sector. It's childcare, it's early education, it's social work, it's working with parents, it's working with children, it's working across a range of disciplines. And some of the debates we used to have about the children's workforce is something like pediatric cardiac surgery. So is that surgery, he, he only operates on children only operates on babies, would you call him part of the children's workforce? I can tell you one thing, he wouldn't call himself part of the children's workforce, and I, I, I emphasize him because it probably is a he. But I think that's a really important notion about the skills that that surgeon needs in talking to parents at very critical times, which often they don't have. And one of the things about the children's workforce is that very interesting mix of skills about working with children and working with adults. I'm going to talk mainly about early years, and I'm going to, what I want to do is draw a distinction that I think always got muddled between those people who work in children's centers and those people who work in childcare and early education, early childcare, um, um, early childhood education here at the CEC is the um, is the sort of uh, acronym that's used by the OECD for um, for early years childcare work which I would put together, early education and childcare. But I think it's a very different job working in a children's center. So in children's centers, we have community workers, health workers, we do have early years specialists, but we also have outreach workers, and occasionally we have health people. We have midwives, health visitors, job center plus staff. So we have a very wide variety of disciplines and people coming from different backgrounds working in children's centers. In early uh, childhood education and care, we have teachers, we have early years professionals, we have level three. Now it's up to two thirds of level three, which is very good, but that means that one third are level two or below, and I bet you that one third who are level two or have no qualifications are in the baby rooms. Because they always think that you need less skill to work with babies. I would argue you need more skill. So I think, I think that, that's a real issue. Um, what is needed? Well, one of the things, when I was writing my book on short stuff, one of the things I thought that was really interesting is that I believe now one of our biggest mistakes was that we didn't think enough about the skill base needed to run a children's center. I just think we didn't, you know, we didn't, I think Norman Glass went around and met me and Gillian Pugh and a few other people and thought, well, there's hundreds of them out there. But that particular skill base is really quite complicated. So as I said, if in children's centers you have a role of people, a variety of people coming from different backgrounds, then you have to understand the role of those different organizations and have respect for them. You have to understand different funding streams, which if you're used to working in early education, if you're in a statutory nursery school, you wouldn't have had to think about funding streams. It would all come from one base. But in children's centers, it comes from sometimes health, sometimes the volunteer sector, certainly the local authority. More and more children's center staff are having to apply to foundations and trust for their funding. You have to understand staff management and organization. If you think about what it means to run a, a, an average size primary school, Head teachers get a lot of management training, but there's no mandatory training for children's center leaders. You have to understand data analysis on community needs. Head teachers don't have to understand that in the same way. Head teachers know that basically, basically what parents want is their children to be able to read and give them their sums. Numeracy and literacy in primary school. There's lots of other things. I'm not diminishing how difficult it is. But the shared notion about what a children's center is supposed to achieve is actually quite complex. There isn't a shared notion. And therefore, understanding what the community expects, what your funders expect, and then understanding the data analysis on reach, knowing who isn't coming as well as who is coming. 
and devotion and outreach. All these are particularly complicated skill set. Early childhood education and care, understanding child development. I remember when Beverly and I worked together, we just argued and argued and argued. We still haven't got far enough. We have a teacher model which is about five down, not zero up. We don't have a model that really is about understanding babies from antenatal right through to two, three, four year old. And I think that under fundamental understanding of child development, particularly language development, is critical in early childhood education and care. A deep understanding of the curriculum. And believe it or not, I know this sounds really comfortable with basic maths and science, but I really do mean basic. But if you think about secondary science, in secondary schools, it's all practical. Right? It's in labs. It's people doing stuff. Well, think about the nursery setting. Think about water play. Think about sand play. Think about volume. We, one of the things I used to do when I worked in the nursery was we used to, we used to pretend, have a pretend rocket, blow up a balloon, tie it to a straw, and then let the water out and see the balloon shoot across the room. That's, that's rocket science. <laughs> that's the way jet engines work by the power going out the back and the balloon going that way. You do that with kids, you get them to count 10, 9, 8. It's great fun, but it's fundamental science. And of course, the kind of people who go into early years are very uncomfortable with science and maths. They think they don't know it, but they know it, they just don't know what they know. So I, I'm more than sympathetic to family and family circumstances. When I first worked in a social services day nursery in Edinburgh, apologies for any Scots in the rooms, it was a social services day nursery. Children were there on referral only. And the staff were just so rude about the parents. They were just so unpleasant about, you know, why is she taking a taxi? Uh, you know, and actually parents can win either way because you got in trouble if you took a taxi. But you also, those of you who work in nurseries, you know when you bring the junk food and stuff, but the parents bring the boxes in on junk food and the staff go through them and say, why is she buying prepared foods? You know, well, you know, all the criticism, all of us, that people, you get what I'm saying? That, that judgment all the time on the way, through, and it's always the mothers, of course, on the mothers not doing right for their children. It, you can't be judgmental. It's not going to get you, it's not going to get results with the children or the parents. And that ability to encourage parents in the home learning environment, these are the things that are needed in um, early childhood care. And do we get them? Well, sometimes. But now, what we're picking up in the Oxford research on uh, the evaluation of children's centers is that where a man there used to be one manager for one center, the manager is now managing two, three, four centers. And what that means is that the most qualified person in the center doesn't have contact with parents and families because they're covering too wide a brief. And it leaves the less qualified to work with now the pressure to reach the neediest families. I'm very uncomfortable with the pressure to reach the neediest families, but I'm particularly uncomfortable if the people who are required to reach the neediest families do not get the proper training, qualifications, and support and supervision to do it. It's a real struggle. It's very, very difficult. And it's hollowing out centers. So there's, there's a real push not to close children's centers. Instead of closing them, they're making them so thin that they can't do anything, and then we'll find out they don't do anything, and then we'll close them. I would rather have fewer, better with better qualified staff. Early childhood education care, the same thing. Sometimes we get it. There's an evidence of improvement in settings for three and four year olds. I'm sure that you've heard that from Ofsted. But I'm just going to tell you very quickly some research that um, uh, Oxford has recently done, Sandra Mavis has done, on you know all the EPI research on quality in early years. Well, the <coughs> test they use for quality is something called Eckers and Gitters. Eckers is for three and four year old rooms. Gitters is for under three year old rooms and they compared the Eckers and Gitter scores with the Ofsted scores. For the three and four year olds, there was a reasonable correlation. For the under threes, there was no correlation. So there were settings that Ofsted rated as excellent, which under the Gitter score were particularly poor. And the reason that happens is that Ofsted rates a setting, not individual rooms by the age of the children, and Ofsted is fundamentally about education, not about babies. I don't think they know what to look for in rooms for the very young children. So it's a real worry in terms of, in terms of what children are getting. I'm very concerned about under threes, and I'm also particularly concerned about the current suggestions about the deregulation of child minors going the wrong way. So how do we improve things? Well, it can't be done without money. That, that's, that's the biggest problem, um, and I think that's a problem for, for everybody these days. 
But I think the children's centers, I think it is a disgrace that there's no entry requirements to run a children's center. You know, there is no qualification requirement to run a children's center. I mean, there is in schools. You can't be a head teacher of the school if you haven't been to university and you don't have a teaching degree and you haven't been to the uh, uh, National uh, Center for School Leadership. But there's no entry requirements for children uh, for uh, teachers for uh, to run a children's center. How do we ensure that those centers, lucky enough to have more than those great staff, have systems that help them work together? And what should be a minimum requirement to call it a children's center? Because we have centers that have half a person and a bunch of leaflets, and centers that have a lot of staff, a lot of multidisciplinary working, and some very, very fine working. And if we call them the same thing and mother of them up, again, we can't evaluate and understand what we're doing. On early, uh, early care and, and uh, early childhood education and care, we have the Nut Brown Review, which is really very, very good in terms of its recommendations. You can see, you know, you can see there, I just, I'm, I'm just anxious with, you know, heart and mouth how the government is going to respond to the Nut Brown Review, because it's very, very ambitious. It is the right way to go, but it's very ambitious. I can't see us doing it within certainly the next five or ten years. So what would success look like? This is the last one. But don't, 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 don't just lose hope. Um, I would like to see all full service of uh, children center leaders with the National Professional Qualification and Integrated, integrated Center Leadership or something equivalent. I really think to run a large children's center, you need to degree a master's <coughs> I really do. And I think it's a complicated, difficult business. And the other reason, and I, you know, I, I, I think this is a, it's something that, again that occurred to me while I, was, while I was writing the book on Sure Start, is that if we want services to join up, the person who's running the service, the children's center service, has to have some parity of esteem with the other professions they're wanting to join up with. So if you're going to call up the middle manager in health, that middle manager in health has to know who you are and has to believe that you're a peer. And we have a very long history of people in early years not being considered peers, not being considered other say, You know, when I was running a children's center many, many years ago, and I ran a local um, community pediatrician because I was compared, I was very concerned about too many children going into hospital. She, she thought I was out of my mind. A children, you know, a nursery worker bringing up a consultant pediatrician. She honestly, she just, she wasn't rude. She just was puzzled about how I could possibly be questioning the decision of doctors. The irony is, many years later, I was on the board of the PCT that employed her, and of course, she didn't recognize me because she wouldn't have seen the same person who had been working in a nursery on the board of a PCT. So that parity of esteem is really, really important. I also think that there's a recognition of the skills and qualities needed to work effectively with children and families. And what that recognition means is better paying conditions for, for, uh, for care staff across the age range. As I say, I'm very, very concerned with what happens with under threes and particularly under twos. I think that it's going to be very hard. I do congratulate the government that they have a touch of three and four year old offer 15 hours a week. I think that's really good. I was worried it would go. I'm really pleased they haven't, they, they haven't reduced paid maternity leave. I think that's really good. But I think that we have a long way to go to get our fragile infrastructure as good as it should be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. Now, I, I know uh, quite a few people have got to go. Stephen Twig, which others might want to do, which is to ask the government um, 
First of all, have they had, have they done a risk analysis on the cumulative impact of the government cuts and the changes to welfare on the children of Liverpool, not to 19 And I'm waiting for a response on that. Um, and I think if everybody else did the same, we might just catch the kids before they get, before they literally tip over the edge. Um, I really welcome uh, Child Poverty Action Group's research because it's really clear um, and we have risks obviously as you know come on to Liverpool and help us with our children to feed into our strategy. Um, and I think that, that needs to be put out there very uh, very openly. The other issue I have that is that is scary is that so 30 years ago people were used to campaigning. People don't know how to do that anymore. People are starting to, to wind it up now it may be too late and I'm calling it a Liverpool silent screen because there's a lot of families behind the doors um, that are impacted by this already and they're being so stigmatised by the right wing press that they don't want to put their head above the parapet. The levels of chronic stress are very, very high which obviously then impacts on mothers having babies with the stress hormones are flooding around that child before they're even born. Um, so I suppose I'm just saying please we join together and stop Traveling, but we're really doing so well. Thank you, Jane. Anybody else want to follow that? Okay, perhaps I can just say um, on the question about cumulative impact. Uh, you know, a number of people, including me in Parliament in the Commons and the Lords, have laid down written questions on precisely that. And the cumulative impact on children and the cumulative impact on women which is a proxy for families generally. Um, and we haven't, you know, they haven't done any risk assessment, cumulative or otherwise. And um, they, I don't think the government intend to, to do that, even though equality impacts are required actually by law of governments as well as other organisations. Sorry, James, you want to come back? Gloomy, but I do think it's very, very important 
this discourse about is it individual's behavior or is it not having money? Because the not having money is, and everyone who argues that it's about individual's behavior has a well-paying job. You know, I've never heard anybody argue that it's about behavior when they themselves aren't working and aren't in a well-paying job. So I think, I think that's very, very important. No matter what you do, getting that across, I think is the most important thing because it's really turning the debate in a very, very unhelpful way. And it's assuming that nobody who takes drugs or drinks too much is not poor. You know, I mean, that, that, that flip side, but I think is also very, very interesting. But we don't worry if you're a lone parent or you take drugs or you drink too much if you're not poor, because then you can pay for your psychiatrist. But it is, it's, it's for me, in terms of the debate from CPAG and from, say, the Children Home Wrong Trustee, <coughs> that is the key to the issue. Parenting class, 20 quid, I'll take the 20 quid, thank you very much.